Coming up on this week's show, author K.D. Edwards takes us to Atlantis in his Tarot Sequence series. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 223 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com. And with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Will Knaus. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. We'll have more information on how you can join them in just a moment. And at the end of the show, we'll also have a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week. Hello, everybody. Another week, another episode of the show. Uh, We've got lots of great stuff to talk about. Shall we get to it? Let's do it. (laughs) We don't have any books for this week's Romance Revisited segment, but we do want to briefly talk about a book that both Jeff and I personally revisited at the start of 2020, and that was Cat Sebastian's The Soldier's Scoundrel. Yes, we had the opportunity to join two of our frolic Podcast Network hosts, Zoe and Kelsey, from over at Tea and Strumpets. They invited us along as they took their first foray into MM Regency romance. We had a great time talking to them. It was so fun to talk about this book with somebody else. I know. I think I'm not a huge fan of rereading books, but I think this was the perfect way to kick off 2020. I love this book to pieces, and having the opportunity to talk about it with someone else was like pure joy. I had so much fun. I did too. They're really great. That episode of Tea and Strumpets will be out on Thursday, January 16th. We'll have a link in the show notes so that you can get to the Tea and Strumpets website, and we hope you will join us as we join them to talk about Cat Sebastian's Soldier's Scoundrel. Yes, definitely. Also, on the theme of revisiting romance, we have a re-release announcement. Indeed. The Hockey Player's Heart, which is the book that Will and I co-wrote that came out back in 2018, is celebrating its book birthday this Wednesday, January 15th. And on that occasion, we are re-releasing it out into the world. It has a spiffy new cover on it. It is the same story if you've read it before, but it is coming out into Kindle Unlimited for the first time. So if Kindle Unlimited is the way that you read, you will be able to read this second chance romance about a hockey player and the boy who once tutored him in high school starting this Wednesday. Yeah, I hope everyone will check it out if you haven't already. Also, we want to quickly mention our Patreon. Now, if you haven't heard before, we do have a Patreon account, and that is where we post bonus material for all of our diehard hardcore fans. <laughs> yes, the, the Patreon is the place to hang out if you're a super fan. We do monthly bonus episodes there. If you pledge at some of the higher amounts, you get a sneak peek at the people that we're talking to because we release our interviews a week early there. So yeah, people last week people got to hear Katie Edwards in advance. So that's one of the things that you can get over on Patreon. And we're celebrating our Patreon anniversary this month. We've had the Patreon going now. This is its third year. We can't thank everybody enough for the support that they give to Patreon, whether they come in for a few months and then have to exit out or if they have been there since the beginning, of which there are quite a few who've been there since we started. You help make the transcripts on this show possible. You help make possible the the hosting and the upkeep of the show. And we can't thank you guys enough for supporting us in that way to keep this show cranking along. And we are going to be recording the very first bonus episode for 2020 in just a few days. So if you are currently a Patreon member and you want to ask us, uh, well, just about anything, frankly, please head on over to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Also, if you have any ideas about other bonus content you'd like us to provide, we are certainly open to taking suggestions. Now, if you aren't already a member of our Patreon community and want to learn more about what we offer everyone every single month, just head on over to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. In The Hockey Player's Heart, the feel-good gay romance by Jeff Adams and Will Knauss, hockey star Caleb Carter returns to his hometown to recover from an injury. 
He never expects to run into his one-time crush at a grade school fundraiser. Seeing Aaron Price hits him hard, like being checked into the boards. The attraction is still there, even after all these years, and Caleb decides to make a play for the school teacher. You miss 100% of the shots you never take, right? Aaron has been burned by love before, and can't imagine what a celebrity like Caleb could possibly see in a guy like him. Their differences are just too great. But as Aaron spends more time with Caleb, he begins to wonder if he might have what it takes to win the hockey player's heart. Get the hockey player's heart at Amazon.com. So this week I got to try a new to me author, Jackson Knight, and I got to sample the first book in their Fairyland romance series, and it's called Rival Princes. So imagine, if you will, a workplace romance. The trope in that kind of story is usually two characters who are up for like some sort of job promotion, and they fight tooth and nail while at the same time falling in love. Imagine if that workplace was a theme park, and our two main characters were fairy tale princes, or, well, the actors portraying those princes at the uh, meet and greets and the parade that happened throughout the day at a theme park. And that is what you get in Rival Princes, a story I was like completely head over heels in love with. I mentioned that I enjoyed having the chance to revisit Cat Sebastian, and reading this for the very first time brought me so much joy. I'm so happy that 20. 20- 20 has gotten off on an amazing romance foot. So let me tell you a little bit more about this story. Nice guy Nate, through his friend, gets a job at the Fairyland theme park. Uh, and he figures he's probably just going to work in concessions or maybe be a greeter at the front gates. But from the moment they see him, they go, no, you got the look. You're going to be one of our princes. So they fast track him to become Prince Valor. The previous actor who was playing this prince didn't really work out and they haven't had one for a while. So they want to fill this slot very quickly. One of his co-workers is a guy named Dash. And he's essentially one of the senior members of the costume characters team he's been there a very long time and he takes his job as a fairyland prince very seriously and he is essentially tasked with training this newbie and getting him up to speed as quickly as possible there is of course you know attraction and heat between our two main characters that's almost instantaneous but at the same time there is friction because Dash doesn't want to be outprinced by this this new guy. One day in in their training, while Dash is teaching Nate how to walk in a regal princely manner, the friction becomes too much and he kisses Nate, which is completely against fairyland rules. There's like a no fraternization policy. So this creates additional problems between our two heroes. Part of Nate's training is is that he eventually goes out into the park in what they call a fursuit. That's like essentially a a complete costume character. In this case, he's a unicorn. Uh, And he happens to go out for the very first time on an incredibly hot day. And he's doing really, really well until he becomes dehydrated and has a, well, a mild case of heat stroke. And Dash does everything that he can to take care of Nate. It's a very sweet hurt comfort moment and it really speaks to the conflict that's going on in Dash. He eventually learns that he as a senior member of the crew is actually going to end up giving a sort of like a job performance review for Nate because the essentially the ma- the imagineers are working on a brand new float for the parade. And they're either going to give Nate's Prince Valor a super cool animatronic dragon, or they're going to give Dash's character a brand new rainbow float. And so (laughs) the opportunity for this cool new job opportunity rests on what Dash is eventually going to do. At one point, while they're trying to out-prince one another during a character meet-and-greet, some rowdy teenagers accidentally push a little girl into a pond. And Nate springs to the rescue and jumps in after her, which 
creates a social media fervor. His picture starts appearing all over the internet, you know, hashtag Prince Valor, hashtag, you know, (laughs) real prince, that kind of a thing, which frustrates poor Dash to no end. It doesn't matter what he does. Nate just seems naturally inclined to do this prince thing so very well. At the same time, Nate is incredibly attracted to his co-worker but also very frustrated because dash runs like so hot and then so cold a minute later it's really very confusing since this is a workplace story there's a wonderful array of secondary characters that surround our two main heroes i want to quickly call out the two young women who portray the princesses to our hero's princess. They're both really wonderful. They're very funny and very sassy. And at one point, Dash's best friend, the the woman who plays his consort princess, she essentially tells him to get his head out of his ass and ask Nate out because you know you wanna. Uh, It's a very, very funny moment. Eventually, Dash does do the right thing and creates a really wonderful grand gesture, as well as a really interesting, specific, small gesture that proves that he understands that he was the main obstacle in the developing relationship between him and Nate. So I I thought it just, oh gosh, it just melted my heart. It was all so sweet and so wonderful. I thought the theme park setting was really fantastic. I think I've spoken to this before. I'm I'm fascinated by the sort of beautiful artificiality of theme parks. I think it's part of one of the reasons why I like theater so much cuz it's actors and it's costumes and it's sets. It's all fake, but you end up getting a genuine emotional experience out of that. And I think theme parks are the same thing. It's all phony, but you get, you know, certain, you know, you get, you know, thrills and there's romance and there's fun. So I think having a romance set in that arena, it really pushes all of my buttons. And I really liked Rival Princes. And you know, I'm going to be picking up the other books of this series. So thank you, Jackson Knight. You got my 2020 started off right. I'm so very happy. That sounds delightful. I mean, and just the grin on your face as you're describing this book was pretty darn priceless. So you started your 2020 with such joyful, you know, sweet romances. I went completely the other direction with the books <laughs> I'm going to talk about today. We're going to dive into some hurt, comfort, some angst, and and some pretty deep topics with the books that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to kick it off with Rescue Me by K.M. Newhold, which is all about hurt, comfort. This is her first book in the Heathens, Inc. series, and I picked this up because I really liked what she did with her rock stars in the Replay series, which happened to be the first books of hers that I picked up, even though it was a later series. She knocked this story of a tattoo artist and firefighter slash former Marine out of the park, just as she'd done with those musicians. Now, I'm going to caution here because this book takes off at a breakneck pace. We meet Madden, who is the tattoo artist who works at Heathen's Inc., and Thane, who's a firefighter new to town. They are at a local club. They're surrounded by pulsing music, and they're on the verge of going home together. But suddenly there are screams and the sounds of gunfire, and Thane's training kicks right in, and he works to get them both to the exit. But in the crowd, they end up separated, and Madden ends up shot. Uh, Thane immediately doubles back to rescue Madden, and it's Thane's colleagues who actually respond to this shooting, and it's that moment that he ends up outed at his workplace. And that's just in the first chapter. So this book starts with a difficult scene, and there are more difficult times ahead. Madden's injuries include his leg, which is expected to heal with no problems. But the prognosis is not so good for his hand, however, because it's not really clear if some of the nerve damage is going to allow him to be able to continue as a tattoo artist. And add to that that he's a recovering drug addict who is now in severe pain and knows that he really needs to avoid the pain medication. And, of course, there's the trauma of being in that club that night that haunts him through his recovery. 
Now, KM does a great job creating a terrifically likable character with Madden, who you just want to wrap him up and make everything better. None of it's easy for these guys, though, and at no point did she cut Madden any slack in dealing with his hand, the pull of the drugs that's there to deaden all of his feelings, or those recurring flashes of being in the club. The realities of trying to start a relationship are equally compelling here as Thane and Madden navigate going from potential hookup partners to going into this kind of more friends caregiver status to eventually finding their way towards becoming lovers. Thane and Madden are even more thrown together because Thane really wants to help this young man. Madden lives in a walk-up, and of course, in the condition that he's in when he's released from the hospital, his, his leg is in no condition to be walking upstairs. Thane offers a first-floor guest room in his house, and you know Thane, of course, has no idea the baggage he's getting into here with Madden or how deep that runs, but all, all Thane wants to do, of course, is help. Now, the relationship unfolds here so very sweetly and tentatively, as neither guy wants to rock the boat too much as they you know, get into this moment of Madden trying to heal. But as Madden gets stronger, he starts trying to help out more around the house and get to know Thane better, even bringing Thane into some of the things that he likes to do. So he actually takes Thane to a teen art program that he works at at an LGBTQ center where he works with the young people around art. And Thane, for his own side, has to come to terms with coming out. Photos of him carrying Madden out of the club went viral. And so there are things that he needs to say to his parents and close friends. As you can imagine, things are only going to get worse before they get better because KM just keeps adding the suffer for these guys. But it's the undercurrent of deep caring for Thane and Madden that kept me turning the pages no matter how rough things got. And these two finally getting their happy and coming out on the other side. And certainly while everything wasn't made magically all better for Madden, it was a wildly satisfying ending, seeing how you have a good idea that he's going to be okay now that everything is starting to settle out. There are some great supporting characters here too, as you can imagine with a series title of Heathen Zinc. We got to know several of the staffers uh, who are all friends with Madden, and they play a pretty big role here. Thane's also got a friend in Zade who comes to town and meets everybody, and it's Zade and another Heathen's Inker that are the center couple in book two. Uh, they all get just enough screen time to make me very interested in all their stories. I can see why this is a series that people pick up a lot, and I'm very happy I read Rescue Me. If you're game with characters who really go through hell and back, and you're comfortable with a book opening the way this does, I really think you're going to enjoy reading about these guys. Moving on to another book that I kicked off 2020 with. This is one that got recommended to me uh, by fellow author and podcaster Mark Leslie Lefebvre. And he connected me with this debut novelist, Jeffrey Soto. And as a result, I got to read Cloud Cover. Now, up front, I will say that this is not a romance. Although there are some romantic elements here, we do not have a couple that ends up with an HEA at the end of this book. What we do have here is a very poignant story of Tony. He's a 35-year-old Filipino man dealing with the loss of his mother, a breakup with a really horrible boyfriend, and he's trying to manage an eating disorder that's connected to issues with his body image. He's been labeled so much over the years by his mom, by his ex, by just gay culture in the clubs, that it's, it's really like worn him down over the years. He leads a rather mundane life. He's taken over the house that his mom left him, but he hasn't done much with it since he got it. He works a cubicle job that he hates, uh, which at least he offsets that teaching writing at a local community center, which is the part of his life that he really enjoys because what he really wants to do is be creative. He goes out with his friends at night, but he doesn't really want to do that because if he goes out, he might eat and then he's going to have to purge before he ends up adding weight. He really so desperately wants to be happy and lead a quote unquote normal life. But for every step forward he takes, there's one or more steps back. And even meeting Antonio who is completely smitten with him and really wants a relationship and wants to help Tony any way he can to get his health issues in order, it only pushes Tony further into a spiral. Now, in this book's front matter, Jeffrey writes that his intentions for the book were to show the perspective of someone suffering from, as he puts it, a disordered state of mental and physical health. And Jeffrey has really crafted a story 
that lends the reader right alongside Tony as he tries to find balance and health in his life. Uh, I really found Tony's journey compelling. Uh, it's, it's an emotional, very well worthwhile read, and Jeffrey did a great job of making Tony a character that I really wanted to root for and for him to find his way. Now, this book isn't going to be for everyone, but I am very glad that I discovered Cloud Cover, and I very much look forward to what Jeffrey Soto writes next. Lastly, this past Friday, TJ Klune released the free short story Feral Song on his website. It's entry 3.5 in the Green Creek series and is meant to be read between Heart Song and this fall's release of Brother Song. This short story is everything a Green Creek fan could want. Within the story, we get vignettes from the Bennett brothers Carter, Kelly, and Joe, as well as one from Gavin, who we learned so much more about in Heart Song. These vignettes are powerful, especially the ones with the brothers, as they come to grips with what has happened so far. There are a couple of specific passages that really impacted me that I can share without spoilers. As Kelly at one point is comforting Carter, there's this. He wants to tear the world apart for being so unfair, for putting the weight of everything upon their shoulders once more. Don't they deserve peace? Don't they deserve to have one fucking day where they can just be? Indeed. I feel that so often in these Green Creek books because the good times are fleeting for the Bennets, and I really hope TJ gives them something stupendously good by the time we get to the end of Brother Song. There's also a very poignant flashback with Joe, and it looks at how family will often make promises they can't be sure they'll keep. The final line in this moment, it's a promise he'll keep until he doesn't, stabbed my heart so very hard. Now, not only has TJ crafted one amazing short story, but Kurt Graves delivered so much in the performance. He always voices these stories perfectly, but this time he's added a music score. In the same way that a score can enhance a film, this score that he's added to the audio version amplifies in the best way his outstanding performance. I'm convinced, too, that Kurt can make me weep anytime he says, like candy canes and pine cones, like epic and awesome. It's such a simple thing, but it's where all of this started, and those words, done by him, evoke such emotion for me. Yes, I love the story, and I can't wait for Brother Song in August. If you haven't read the Green Creek series, you should, and if audio is your thing, definitely pick those up, because Kurt makes it all the more epic and awesome. And one last note, if you listen to the Feral Song audio, heed Kurt's advice to listen all the way to the end, because he reveals a cool new podcast that's on the way. I'm not going to steal his thunder here and talk about it, but you all should go check it out because I think that's going to be a real cool thing that's going to start up in March. If you're interested in learning more about the books or anything else that we've talked about in this week's show, all you have to do is go to the show notes page for episode 223 at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online. Please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. So I recently had the opportunity to speak with Katie Edwards. Katie had one of the top books on Lisa's list of favorites for 2019. And I was really excited to talk to him to get all of the details on his Tarot Sequence series novels. Katie Edwards, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It is our pleasure. Lisa from The Novel Approach raved about The Hanged Man, and it ended up in her top of 2019 list just a couple of weeks ago. I was just listening to the podcast. The year is new, but it's the best thing that's happened to me this year so far. How about that? That's excellent. Just kick off the year that way. Yeah. For those who don't know the tarot sequence, tell us about that series and then about the latest book, The Hanged Man. Sure. It is The Hanged Man just came out in December. It's the second book in the tarot sequence. It, it essentially is a bit of a reimagining of the Atlantis tale. Instead of having been a mythical island that sank beneath the sea, I imagine that is something that was uncovered by humanity in the 1960s when technology started to reach out towards the star. And they were able to actually see Atlantis from outer space, which is something they hadn't been able to see, say, from a ship or an airplane. 
And once I had this idea in my head of, of something like that, this lost civilization novel, I started kind of coloring in the details. And I've always wanted to do a novel based around the tarot mythology and, and tarot cards and the major arcana. And then combine that with elements of, I love urban fantasy, I love mystery, I love touches of romance, I'm a huge believer of found family and different sorts of love and family type relationships and series. And all that came together to the story that I published, and I've got a lot planned for it, but the second one um, just hit, I've been pretty pleased with the reaction so far. Where do readers find themselves as The Hanged Man opens? When all is said and done, I want to. I, this is going to be nine novels. I have nine novels planned, and they're three trilogies. So, Hangman is a bit of a bridge between the beginning and the climax of the first trilogy, and I was really nervous about that because not only is it a, a bit of a middle child, it's also my sophomore effort being published, and you you always worry that it's going to get lost in the shuffle or not live up to expectations, or people will simply see it as a bridge to the third novel, but. For the most part, that hasn't happened at all. It picks up right after the events in the first novel. I am definitely leading to something big in the third novel, but so far from what I've been sussing out from readers, it really stands on its own as a story, and I'm really happy about that because there are certain elements of it that I've been playing around with for years, waiting to see on page, and pretty happy with the reaction so far. Excellent. Where did you get the inspiration to decide that Atlantis was this thing that you could see from space in the 1960s? Where did all that come from? I have no, I, I guess I, I've always, I, I, I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'll tell you something else I haven't told many people, but I've always wanted to do a lost civilization novel. I find I'm just fascinated by not just, I mean, there, there are many different mythologies based around lost civilizations. Atlantis is only one of them. But not just that, but think about the period of time in human history when the entire world was essentially a lost civilization. No one knew, you know, what existed on the other side of the globe or, you know, all the different pathways they charted with the seas. And I've always been interested in that time period. It's just, you know, ripe for fiction and especially the supernatural. And I when I had this idea about well how could Atlantis possibly exist and thinking about how it could be hidden from the world and when would that be revealed would they make the decision or would technology reach the point where it would be impossible to hide it from from the rest of you know essentially the human world and I started doing this research about I actually contacted NASA and asked them when the first rocket was that flew over the northern Atlantic that took pictures of the curvature of the world. So I knew literally what was the first rocket in orbit that passed over where I would imagine my island of New Atlantis or Atlantis was um, going to be built. So I put a lot of thought into the backstory before I finally started writing it, but I found, you know, it's people know a little bit about Atlantis in the sense of it's a myth, but they don't know enough that I can create whatever I want out of it. So it mm. was a, a bit of a slate that someone gave me, but more or less a blank slate. I love that you called NASA. Even myself as an author, I wouldn't think to call NASA. I'd be looking that up on Google somewhere, but I like that you called them. You could, I couldn't find it on Google. That's how esoteric that information is. How, I mean, it's, I mean, even now knowing the answer, you can't find it on a search on Google. It's buried in one of my email accounts. It's actually going to be an element for one of my future novels. But they were, I, I would imagine they loved the question because it took a couple of weeks to get a response, but they're like, yeah, we had fun tracking this down. <laughs> How did you even know who to call? I mean, oh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at researching. I do human resources in my day job, but I also work for a university system, and I'm involved in higher ed. And any job I've ever had has always had a huge research component to it. So I'm pretty good about, you know, ferreting stuff out when I need to. That's just awesome. So some of the questions I have for you, I actually got from Lisa because she had questions. <laughs> I definitely am going to appreciate those questions because she has given me so many great recommendations from my own book list and my own reading list throughout the year. So why the tarot? Why did you go with the tarot? And how did you decide to use that as the idea as inspiration for characters? I, I, part of it, well, I guess it goes back to like golden age fantasy from say like the 80s with Piers Anthony when he did his incarnation of immortality. And he took some really huge elements of the universe and and turn them into people. He had people 
set, standing in for fate and time and death. And those are the three that I remember. I'm sure there are more, God and the devil. And I just love the idea of that. I, there's something about archetypes that have always appealed to me, and not just on a grand scale of like the backstory, like the major arcana of tarot cards or you know forces of human nature, but even my characters are archetypes. Since I've been wanting to write as a kid, I have my rune, what I call my rune archetype, my brand archetype. I have others that I'll put in other stories, but... It seems like it's such an easy way or almost like a shorthand with communicating with people. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, you have your comic relief character. You have your your, your wise ass. You have your, you know, your smart scholarly library type character for stories. But for the tarot cards, the major arcana in particular, I mean, I think they were – they're all based on imagery. Different tarot cards have different images, but – imagery is huge so turning those into real people or real thrones and real courts it seemed like kind of a natural step to me and plus each of the major arcana tarot cards are really based around human appetites and elements of the human experience like you know fortune and nature and death and religion so it made exploring them a little bit more interesting mm -hmm. did you go so far as to use the tarot to set the characters' personalities and even to see what they might do in certain situations or to help inspire the book further? I do a little bit. Definitely not as much as my readers think. And my readers come up with some interpretations that blow me out of the water. If anything, they've done more research than I have. And I mean, the whole thing about tarot cards is it's based upon unconscious symbolism. So sometimes it's even hard to tell what you intend and what you don't intend. But tarot cards also kind of give you a buffer in that depending on how you read them, they can be normal upward facing or they can be reversed if they're upside down in the reading. So that really covers basically what the tarot card means and its exact opposite. <laughs> so that gives me a little bit of wiggle room if I'm a little bit off. But I did research um, in the sense of, for instance, I like – the Sun Court I picked because it seems a little bit like a card associated with the Phoenix. And this is definitely a story about redemption of a court in a way and a, um, the, the prince of a fallen court. And also the Sun card in, in like a tower reading can also have to do with artists and creativity and works of art. And that applies to me as a writer. So I, I definitely – who I picked for my bad guys and good guys is definitely inspired by some of what I know personally of tarot cards. Mm-hmm. Were you interested in tarot or using them outside of the writing or did you get I, I into do. it because of the writing? No, I do. And I, I think, I no, I got into, well, I heard about them. They interested me. I thought from a creative perspective and then I started using them myself and they're really good tools of meditation. I mean, I'm not going to read too much into the metaphysics of it, but when you sit down with a deck of tarot cards and you have a question and all these images appear in front of you, your mind starts making connections. And I'm a firm believer that we all kind of know what we need to do in any given situation, but this is a really good way of connecting you with, damn, that's right. I've got to pay more attention to this, or this is an important part of my life. So I do tarot readings every now and then. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in them, but I, like I said, the, the just the entire concept of the symbolisms they have in them and the different interpretations and using it almost like as a tool of meditation has always fascinated me. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've become fascinated by it more recently too, because I've heard more and more authors using tarot for various things in their writing, whether it's determining characters or trying to unblock if they're stuck in a scene or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm intrigued by that. I have not heard that. That's interesting. It's come um, up on two or three podcasts lately. It's really been interesting. Like, it's, it, like there's this moment of tarot that's happening in like the last six months. Yeah, I know. I want to kind of discourage that. So if you could tell anyone, that, hey, that idea is already taken, go somewhere else. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I, I kind of want to plant my flag here. But I for even when I first started out telling this story, I had backups for everything. Like, mm -hmm. what if another like series came out that heavily used the tarot for an urban fantasy or what if another Atlantis novel came out? I had backups for pretty much everything I wanted to accomplish, but this is what I settled on. It really, it, it's hard to describe if you have no experience with it, but especially for people who think it's like something, you know, quote new age or whatever, what I would have to say is every card and all the interpretations are just littered with hundreds of different types of symbolism. And as you're reading through them, something snags in your brain and you start drawing connections. And I, I don't think there's any necessarily divine force 
driving it, I think that your brain in some cases is the divine force. And just looking at the cards really can make things clearer if you just kind of empty your mind of everything else. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Rune and Brand a little bit. Sure. How do you describe their relationship? Oh, uh, they're my favorite two characters I've ever written. I just absolutely love every moment I spend with them. So essentially in the series, Rune is the prince of sorts. He's the prince of a fallen throne. So he comes from a very, very strong bloodline, and he is Atlantean. Brand is human, but he's been with Rune since they were together in the crib. Literally a couple days old, they were put together in the crib, and they were bonded in via a metaphysical type spell that's called companionship and brand is runes companion a lifelong advisor and bodyguard and um just meant to be something as close as brothers and the two of them i, I don't know what i intended when i started i mean certainly i wanted them to be close friends but it just became way more than that to have someone who shares a light telepathic bond with you someone who will always have your back uh, something closer than family intimate without being being lovers something especially since they're two men this is obviously a very queer positive story and runes in a relationship with a man as the story unfolds but rune and brand while they're very um, intimate they'll share a space on the sofa together you know brand will give rune a, a, a shoulder rub but i don't have them being sexually intimate so kind of exploring a way for two men to have a relationship but avoiding all the landmines of toxic masculinity has been a lot of fun. It's a joy to write them. I mean, I suppose I would say that I remember do you, there's a series, it's on reruns, Murphy Brown. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, for sure. So Murphy Brown, like, is a delightful character to watch, like, on the, the television. Like, she is, she comes up with the greatest sayings and she can put people down in a moment's notice. But it would actually be kind of unnerving to know a person like that <laughs> because, <laughs> I mean, they're incredibly sharp-tongued and at some point they would make you feel six inches tall. And Brand is like that. He's a Murphy Brown type character, but he shares a bond with Rune. So Rune knows literally everything that comes out of Brand's mouth is driven by actual concern and affection and love. And because of that, Rune can respond in a way to Brand that, is natural to them, meaning he's never hurt because underneath it, he knows that brand really cares about him. And so having that as a basis allows me to work in just a different type of love that I've never been able to do between characters before. And people seem to be responding to it. That's incredible. Uh, it touches on so many things that we just see in society today. And it also plays into your aspect of family a little bit too, because these two are not biological brothers. They didn't really find each other because they were bound at birth, but there's that extra stuff there. Yeah, I'm a, I love found family. Any story with found family is is so meaningful to me. I mean, as, as someone, you know, my age, how you grew up, I mean, it is not the same world as when I was a kid. And when I was growing up, coming out of the closet was something that you did almost in your 20s and it very rarely happened in your teens and by the time you came out your entire life was different and found family was the community you made was so important and it's nice to th see things are a little bit different now though found family i think is always going to be a big thing in the gay community but mm -hmm. working on that in any writing story that i tell loving that in any book i read is sort of a cornerstone of me creatively how surreal is it for you to have fan art created? I don't have words for it. I I don't. Like, I I don't. It, I mean, this has been going on since last sun, and it really took off with the lead up to the publication of Hangman. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people designing cards and artwork, some people doing interpretive dance as part of their review interpretive dance inspired by my novel wow. um, making mini quilts doing crossword puzzles coming up with drink recipes based on the characters or cookie recipes based on the characters my readers are amazing they are i i don't even have words to say how much i appreciate them and what an experience they've made for this i did not expect this i'm still not sure if this is normal <laughs> but all i know is every day something new happens where it, someone comes up with something that takes my breath away it's a weird relationship, too, because in some cases, the representation that they've created of my characters, in a way, has helped kind of driven the narrative. <laughs> like, there's this one um, amazing artist. Their name is Vic Gray. And 
they've done a lot of artwork around some of the secondary characters, including Lady Death, who makes an appearance as one of the major arcana in novel two and will become very important. And Vic's representation of Lady Death essentially defines now what I think of Lady Death in my head. It's such like a gorgeous piece of artwork. I, I literally don't have words to describe what what it's been like um, having reader interaction of this level. You know, having setting up a Discord channel because they want to interact with me. The, the the emails I get from people who talking about living in countries where it's not really easy to get gay literature and what this has meant to them, or talking about how having a story with, you know, without the toxic masculinity and having different types of male love and how much they appreciate something like that. It's really going to drive me to try to do better with each novel. That's incredible. I love how you're getting this work out into countries where access to the gay literature isn't what it is in the U S yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause there too often we think of things from like, you know, a U.S. perspective and I, this experience has really broken me from that trying to remember, I mean, things are wildly different elsewhere in the world and what access is like, how different it is overseas than it might be where we are now. It's that's been an eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. What's the furthest away, out of the way place that you've heard from that really surprised you? Mongolia. Mongolia. Wow. Yes, and they and they at least one person there, and this person's awesome. They've like translated quotes and elements of the Last Son and the Hangman into traditional Mongolian script. It's, I, I mean, again, things like that, that just, it's just, it's humbling to a degree that it's even hard to put into words how grateful I am. But Mongolia, I've, I, I have a lot of readers and the lead up to the reveal of the hangman, there were three of us who worked on it, including Kathy, who's in Canada and Sayo, who's in Finland. I have readers in South America who reach out all the time in Asian countries. It's pretty rewarding. That is really wonderful. To, to see the story go worldwide like that. My book has traveled well better than I have. <laughs> I, I have never left the <laughs> continental North American continent, so my book has been overseas before I have. <laughs> you said you've got nine books planned in the series. Are they all planned out? Do you know where you're going in terms of like the big plot points, or is it more granular than that at this point? No, nope, I know exactly what's going to happen right to the last scene. There's room for some things to evolve on their own. Definitely flexibility along the way, but I know the plot of each book. I know the three individual arcs. One of the big things of the first three books are that the narrator, uh, while I think he's very accessible to readers, he's also keeping something from them. So finding out what Rune is keeping from readers is the first three books. And the next three books involve things that have been kept from Rune his entire life. And then the last three books are more or less going to be my no holds bar end game. But it's his story for all nine novels. And each novel, I think, is going to be different enough in flavor that it makes it actually easy to plan. You know, you have your one book where it might be about contagion or one book that might be about a natural disaster as the background. And it makes it kind of easy for me to distinguish it between them as I plan them. That's cool. That's got to be helpful to be able to think of it along those lines. And, of course, that you leave yourself open to make some discoveries along the way, too. Yeah, I think the only thing that I've deliberately not planned out is who Rune is going to wind up with romantically. So I've been very clear with readers. I am not going to close any doors on that. That'll just make it for more fun as you go. I think so, too. And See I find out stuff leads. as I write. So Lisa is extremely interested to know if there's a planned release date for book three yet. There is not. I'm actually writing it right now, and the the publisher I have is would, was waiting for The Hangman to come out. It was a two-book contract to see how things go, but whether um, this publisher picks it up or whether I put it out myself, there will definitely be a Tarot 3. The response has been really, really nice. I mean, the... I I have great readers and they purchase my book and then they buy the audiobook and then they buy the digital book and the kind of response I've seen so far has basically guarantees that there's more life left in the series. Now, this is your debut the series. What got you into writing? I I don't even remember to this day. I don't remember the first thing. I remember 
when I was really, really young, someone gave me a box of Hardy Boy books, like old fashioned, like, you know, mass printed, blue covered Hardy Boy books. I've always wanted to write. I always since I was a kid. And I have this. This is the first thing I've ever published. It's certainly not the first novel I ever wrote. But this is the first time I ever sent anything out to see if it would get published. So I do feel pretty lucky it did. And then, of course, the readers that you've gotten so far just makes it all the more sweet, of course. Yeah, and I think it says a lot about the world. I mean, when I first sent it out, I was convinced when I talked with my agent that, you know, like, I really want to break into mainstream someday. And, and Sarah Megabell, my agent, she would constantly stop me and she goes, Keith, this is mainstream. You know, just because you have gay characters, this is mainstream. And it turns out she was absolutely right. I thought that I would wind up in some weird niche somewhere <laughs> um, and it wouldn't appeal to a wider audience other than, say, gay men. And lo and behold, that's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so it's been rewarding for me to see how different the world is now and how much more acceptance of different kinds of types of storyline and especially a lot of young people who – I mean, they, I don't even think they view this necessarily as a gay series. It's just something with, you know, a found family element and relationships that they're they're attracted to that makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. Well, and you, you know, you deal with Atlantis. So I think you hit several elements there all together. Yeah, I try to make it interesting, too. I put a lot of work into the backstory. You know, maybe, maybe 5% of it will find its way onto a page. But uh, you can always tell, I think, when a writer knows more than the reader does um mm -hmm. that they could answer any question down to what is the average shopping mall like you know what is grocery shopping like in your world that you've created you know, once you can start answering those really picky questions even if they never wind up on the page i think it does translate to readers have a sense of confidence that you built a world that you know more about as an author right and it gives you plenty of room too to even have little extras along the way that you can drop blog posts or emails or whatever to whet the appetite. I do. I do free novellas between every novel too. So that's oh, been fun. I'm a little bit behind on the one that was supposed to happen between number one and two, but it's almost done. It's going to be about a 80 page novella. How did you decide that this series was going to be the thing that made your debut? I kind of knew I wanted to write this series and I kind of knew that I wasn't ready to write this series. So there was a point where I finally kind of settled down in my day job. I had a really good day job. I had a steady paycheck. I didn't have to worry about bills. I could finally say, well, I want to really take writing seriously. I want to send something out to an agent. But first I backed off for a couple of years and I wrote a gay mystery. Then I wrote a young adult novel. I also wrote a contemporary fiction novel. Three novels that will never, ever, ever be released from my drawer. <laughs> they're, they're literally locked in a drawer and no one's seen any of them. And it got me to the point where I could do a novel from beginning to end and understand what worked for me and what didn't, especially with the, the craft of writing, you know, planning versus um, pantser versus planner. And I got to the point where I'm like, okay, now or never. And I started writing the prologue to Last Sun, the first novel. And it's just like, you just know sometimes this is what I was meant to write. And that's the feeling I had when I started it. Mm-hmm. Are you going to tackle these nine novels straight on, or are there other things you're kind of looking at to do as, like, in-betweens or anything like that? I will definitely do some things in-between. I, I definitely want to try to produce at least a tarot novel, at least every year. And if it takes off and there's a lot of interest, I'll do them even more frequently. But I've got other series I want to write as well. So, And I've always wanted to do a young adult series. So I, that's... Not not even on the back burner. It's sort of on a middle burner right now. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask, because you mentioned, like, you wrote The Young Adult, you had a mystery, like, what other genres you wanted to tackle, too. So, yeah. Young Adult, definitely in the future somewhere. Yeah, I've been playing. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big video game player, too. I bought a Switch to play this game called Fire Emblem Three Houses, and it's a bit of, a, like, a Harry Potter-type storyline, but heavily, like, Asian role-playing game-type theme as well. And it's made me realize how much I want to write a boarding house novel, a magical boarding house novel. I want to write my Harry Potter novel <laughs> <laughs> um, with my own stamp on it, my own complete take, my own, you know, my own type of world building. But I've always loved stuff like that, you know, things like, you know, college age stories, you know, going on um, boarding schools, things like that. I I've always wanted to write something like that. So I think I'm going to be focusing on that next. Oh, very cool. So... 
hopefully we get uh, another tarot sequence book in 2020. Is there anything else on your 2020 radar that you can tease us? I do the free novellas between each story. So I owe readers one. I've been publishing it chapter by chapter, and I've got two left for a novella called The Sunken Mall. And I do have another novel, which started out as YA. It's a standalone, but rapidly it turned into more of a new adult than young adult Mm -hmm. that is done. It just needs a little bit of tweaking, and then my agent's going to be sending it out. But it's, it's it's different from, it's sort of, tarot sequence light in that I don't have as much deep world building, but I still focused on the elements of like found family and romance and relationships between characters. That's still a big part of it. Very cool. So how can people keep up with you online to know when all of this stuff is happening? Twitter is probably the best place right now. That's I, if you, if I had to pick one thing I focus on, it's going to be Twitter right now. And that's at KD Edwards underscore NC. I definitely do all my announcements through that and any free material I have snippets. I, there are a lot of sites that do like the quote of the week or the um, book scene of the week. And I, I take advantage of that a lot between my novels and kind of tease stuff that's about to come out. So that's probably one of the best ways. And then katie edwards com is um, my website. All right. Fantastic. We will put links to all this stuff and the books Uh, in the show notes page for this episode so people can easily find everything. Thank you. Keith, thank you so much for coming and telling us about the tarot sequence. Wish you the best of success with The Hanged Man and very, very much looking forward to what you have coming out next. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. This week's interview transcript is brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the author interview for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And thanks again to KD for joining us. I really enjoyed so much of this interview. And the thing that really spoke to me was the fact that he called up NASA. He (laughs) called NASA to get a piece of information to go into this book. And I just, in this era of Google, I think it is so just really cool going old school to get a piece of information like that. It's very cool. All right. I think that's going to do it for this week's show. Coming up in episode 224, we catch up with Megan Maslow as part of our series with Coastal Magic featured authors. It's always great to catch up with Megan, and this time we've got the scoop on the third book in Megan's Starfig investigation series, which is going to be coming out uh, within the next couple months, so you're not going to want to miss all the details on that. Definitely. Remember, everybody, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. New episodes of this show are available every Monday wherever you get your podcasts. You can help support this show with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For more information about joining our community and the bonus content we deliver, check out patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. I'm Kurt Graves. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.